Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lunching with the League. Before we get started, we just want to point out that closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screen. Simply click that small CC icon you see there, and you should instantaneously see the live captioning pop up, which, be forewarned, can get a little creative at times, which can often be entertaining too. And I am Cynthia Peoples locally. I'm here with the Hudson League in Northeast Ohio. And I'm also a volunteer in the State League office and a newly minted state board member. And today it is my honor to introduce our fearless state leader, League of Ohio's executive director, Jen Miller. And many of us are familiar with Jen's very impressive background with the Sierra Club. She most recently served as their executive director like our league. But what many of us may not know about Jen is her extensive reach into communities over the past two decades really, both personally and professionally. Uh, Jen shared with me that she is a passionate community organizer for the arts and a world travel jazz musician, by the way and also promoted social justice issues and environmental issues through positions with Columbus Recreation and Parks, the King Arts Complex, Global Gallery, and OSU. Now, personally, having worked with Jen as a local leaguer with her staff, which is the hardest working staff in the state of Ohio, mind you, and as a board member, I can tell you personally that League could not find a stronger, more technically sound or passionate advocate for democracy than Jen Miller. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that I can say that is because Jen intuitively knows that League's power and sway does not come from positions, policy, or legislation. It comes directly from the people that those positions, policies, and legislation impact. And it is those people and those stories are what drive Jen Miller to literally work herself sick in the lead up to an historic general election and now working just as hard and just as diligently to ensure that the state of Ohio has fair districts and fair maps. So everyone, it is my pleasure and my honor to turn it over to League's executive director, Jen Miller. Oh, Cynthia, you're so wonderful. And let me just say this, this idea for this, this series every second and fourth Monday is actually Cynthia Peoples and Michael Barron. And so here at League, um, we are, we are as, our strength comes from our people, which are our volunteers, our members, our staff, our interns. And it's just an honor. I love this organization because I get to work with rock stars like Cynthia. So thank you for that. Um, I believe we have the Senator here. Um, I just wanted to first say hello to the Senator. Quickly, we do have some events though. Um, please join us uh, in a couple of weeks to talk about transparency in government. Um, we'll be leaning on our friends at Common Cause. Um, we'll have another luncheon with the League, this time with Representative Sweetie um, from Cleveland. Very excited to have her. And then we're going to be talking about school funding, which some may not know that the League has worked on school funding. Uh, for its entire 100 years. Everything education oriented since we were founded in 1920, we have advocated for public education and funding and support. Next slide, please. Uh, please remember that uh, members are the backbone of this organization, please join. And um, we also would love to have you be a donor. This is our Centennial Club. We're 100 years old. We're looking for folks to join us for that. Uh, you get a cool pin and we'd love to have you. And I think it is time now to introduce Senator Teresa Gavarone. So first I wanna just say a little bit about the series. The goal of this series is to get to know lawmakers and leaders in the state house um, circle and we want to have constructive and civil dialogue. So there are lots of things that we uh, agree with the Senator on. There are some things that we may not quite agree. And the whole point of this at a time when we are so divided is let's just have some conversations with folks. And I really am a firm believer in working with folks when we agree. And then if we don't agree that let's talk it out and, and let's see if we can get to more common ground. And um, so Senator um, Gavarone uh, is like me. She's a proud Ohio girl. And uh, uh, I am just really glad that she's going to be joining us. Um, are you there, Senator? 
I think she's there. I am there. I, I was muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> How are you doing, Jen? Good. I'm so glad to see you. I got worried for a minute. No, um, no I was on. <laughs> You're well. So it is um, International Women's Day. So first, I want to say, you know, happy International Women's Day for that's been something celebrated throughout the last century or more as starting really with suffrage. Um, this year, the UN's theme is actually about women and leadership. So I think it's really cool. It's like a happy accident that we have you here, uh, a woman lawmaker. And so I just want to start with that. What really inspired you to get involved in uh, politics and, and to run for office? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I've been an attorney for a long time, since 1994. I uh, got my law degree from University of Toledo after getting a business degree from Bowling Green. Um, and uh, I, I, there was a lot I was seeing in my law practice. On top of being an attorney, I'm also a mother of three who went to public schools, uh, Bowling Green Public Schools. And um, when my kids were little, I was able to um, stay home with them. And when they went to school, I volunteered in the kindergarten classroom. I read with the first graders every Friday. I volunteered in the school library and read them story time and checked out everyone's books and worked with the teachers um, during that, which, which gives you a different perspective on things for sure. Um, and my husband and I are business owners. Uh, we have a little restaurant in Bowling Green. So, um, but, but really it was uh, what I was seeing in my law practice that um, got me into public service. Um, I guess I, I first started, my first elected position was on Bowling Green City Council. And uh, that was, that was, it was really good. I, I felt uh, being a business owner in town, um, getting involved in the community that way was uh, was really important to make sure um, you know we that the business was owners in town were represented on council as decisions were being made that would impact them, um, and, and that's kind of how I got started in politics. But when I went to Columbus, um, it, it truly was what I was seeing in my law practice. Uh, I, in, in a small community like Bowling Green in, in Northwest Ohio, you do a lot of different things. I've represented farmers and I've represented business owners. I've represented college students, um, uh, but, but most of my work really was with families. Um, I, I did a lot of uh, family law and, um, and worked with children. I was a guardian ad light of representing kids whose families were going through a difficult time. But it was through that practice really that um, I, I was just seeing a lot more and more uh, of the impact of the drug addiction crisis and the need for mental health services. Um, yeah, I was representing kids and um, you see how, how the drug addiction crisis is, is impacting not only the individual, but, but their family the court system, the children, the foster care system, um, and uh, and then these kids who, who grow up in, in a difficult environment. And, and what can we do um, to help improve things and, and make sure people who are going through crisis have access to care? So um, I, I, after seeing a whole lot, a series of things over the years, um, when a position opened up down in Columbus, I think, you know what? Um, I can make a difference. And so a lot of the legislation I've worked on has um, been involved in, in that realm of, of mental health and, and access to care issues. So th that's uh, really what kind of uh, drove me um, to seek uh, public office. I just wanna, um, as an attorney, I can say I always saw my role as helping people through a really difficult time because uh, no one was coming to see me unless things were going really bad. Um, no one was coming to see me on, on, a, on a good day. And some people were going through the most difficult challenges in their life. And um, if you can help people through the legal system, help them solve their problems, uh, then that was really rewarding. And so I kind of taken that same philosophy down in Columbus. Um, you're listening to constituents. One of the most important parts of this job is, is listening. And, um, and then being creative, finding solutions and working on ways to help make things better for, for your constituents, the people you serve, but also the state as a whole. 
And so that's kind of been my philosophy is really working to find solutions um, and, and helping people um, make Ohio the greatest place to live, work, and raise a family. And vote. <laughs> oh, uh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, that's great. We actually um, have a, kind of a fair amount in common. So most of my family is historically from Seneca and Sandusky County. Lots of graduates of both UT and BG in my family. So love that Western Lake Erie. Um, okay. this, I just want to ask really quickly on, you know, the future of Lake Erie, and we're going to dig in mostly to education. I mean, elections work and some education, but, you know, any thought on water quality and, and everything that we can do there? You know, when I was a kid, it was really um, pretty mucky, right? And then it got cleaned up and now we're seeing concerns again with, with toxic algae and those things and just wondering what we might see um, in terms of water protections. Um. It's interesting, you may not be aware that my district has more um, Lake Erie shoreline than any other district in the state of Ohio. Uh, my district is all of Erie County, all of Ottawa County, the Lake Erie Islands. Um, so water quality, you know, it's very important to my district, but obviously not just to my district, to the state as a whole in terms of what it brings to, um, to the economy with tourism and um, you know, recreation, but also drinking water. I mean, everybody wants to make sure we have good, safe drinking water, but um, we need to make sure that Lake Erie is, is protected and preserved. You know, not, not just now, but for generations to come. I mean, it is truly the gem of Ohio. I agree with you. I love it up there. So um, we're going to spend, I, we might have to have you a couple times, Senator, just because I think we have so much to talk about with you um, since you are the chair of local government and elections for the Senate. So yeah. I just first like to start with what, and that's my dog in the background. Sorry about that. But I just like to um, start with what are your biggest goals for this committee this year? Well, um, we need to make sure that Ohio is really the gold standard when it comes to elections. We need to make sure that we're doing everything right so that people in Ohio know when they go to vote that their vote is, uh, is being counted and counted correctly. We need to make sure our voters have that confidence when they go to vote. So we wanna make sure we're doing everything we can to make our, our polls accessible and secure and, um, and really doing things right. I. Uh, I sponsored Senate Bill 52, last General Assembly, um, if you remember, and that bill actually had two components. It uh, created a cyber reserve team to make sure that, um, that we have people ready and prepared in the event of a cyber attack, but it also had an, um, an elections auditing component to it that requires three elections or three, um, three races be audited each election. And um, you know, for that legislation, I actually was awarded uh, Legislator of the Year from the Bipartisan Ohio Association of Election Official Officials, which was um, such an honor. But it was really exciting to see it play out this election and to see um, the audits come through and showing Ohio with such high marks. I forget the exact number, it was something like 98%, 99, it was a very high percentage accuracy. So it was, uh, it was really exciting to see that work come through. You know, and thank you for Senate Bill 52. We absolutely supported that. Let's keep going on that. I, I agree with you that our elections here in Ohio are quite secure and have, have been and will continue to be. So thank you for that. How about Senate Bill 14? And for those who may remember, we had this bill from Senator Ruley um, last time as well, which is about voter registration systems. So I'm just gonna remind the audience that right now, voting machines are certified by the state of Ohio for security and accuracy. Our voter registration systems, we have several vendors who provide those for the 88 boards of elections, but we aren't right now um, certifying them. Um, so Senate Bill 14 has that piece and it also puts a cybersecurity expert on the board that certifies voting machines and systems. So would you talk to us about that bill? You're, you know, do you support it? How do you think we move that forward this time? Oh, I think that's really an important piece of legislation. I think we need to make sure that our systems are 
you know, are working properly and everything is done correctly. And also having that cyber expert um, on that on that board is is really important to make sure that there's someone with that expertise to make sure that uh, everything is uh, is secure and working properly. Again, to give voters that confidence and make sure that we are doing things right going forward. Yes, I support that legislation. <laughs> I got it. And our friend Aaron Ackerman uh, of the Ohio Association of Elections Officials says that it's 99.98% accurate was our election. So yay. Thank you, Aaron. I didn't know you were on this call, but um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, I knew it was a very high number and uh, certainly uh, that's a testament to um, the way the way we do things in Ohio. We wanna make sure that we um, we keep that level high or higher going forward. Um, it, it's just so important to get things right. So let's talk about another area where the elections officials in the league and you agree, which has to do with the absentee process. So yeah. for folks to remember absentee voting in Ohio, you don't need an excuse. It's been around for a couple decades. It's a great way to vote, except that it's outdated, right? We developed and adopted um, our absentee voting process before we really had the technology we have today and really mail service was just so much more invested and had more capacity um, and was probably quicker too. So can you talk about online absentee requests and, and what you think we can do about that this year? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we introduced that legislation, I believe it was the fall of 2019 um, before the pandemic hit. Um, uh, because the system is outdated, but boy, did the pandemic ever shed a light on the need for um, for looking at our systems and modernizing things. Um, I think it's important uh, to make it easy for people to access this. You, I, so many people voted absentee for the first time ever and were kind of shocked to find out, okay, I, I've got to find this form. I've got I've got to print a form, I've got to uh, mail it to the Board of Elections and they have to mail me back a ballot, then I have to mail that back in all, you know, um, before the election. So, you know, this is a way really of, of modernizing that process. So you could submit, submit your request for an absentee ballot, you know, online. I think it's, uh, it's very important um, that we make it uh, easier and streamlined. We want to make sure it's, uh, absolutely secure so that uh, it's, um, you know, everything is being done correctly, but I, it, it's really uh, important, I think, to go forward. And I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to work on that. Do you think we'll be able to move that forward, this General Assembly? I'm certainly going to work to do that. Okay. Absolutely. And I I look forward to working with Aaron some more on that. So... <laughs> Good. Well, we're here to stand, we stand ready to help you on that too. How about another issue with absentee voting, especially, um, but also early voting? You know, you come from a district with lots of folks who don't live near the county seat, right? You, and I am a, I'm from kind of rural Ohio myself. So what about multiple early voting centers um, and multiple drop boxes per county? Well, um, certainly that's something that's uh, been raised by people. I, we again need to make sure things are secure. I think um, with the drop boxes, it's important that um, there are cameras monitoring to make sure that there's nothing happening. Um, but uh, certainly it's something that we'll be discussing, I'm sure this General Assembly and hearing all the pros and cons and, and we'll be uh, having lots of conversations on that subject, I'm sure. Well, thank you. I mean, we would really appreciate it if we think about, you know, individuals with disabilities or senior citizens or even in, a, in communities where transit, literally you cannot take transit from your town to where the early vote center and Dropbox are, you know. So thank you for um, con continuing to consider that. How about something we talked about last year was automatic voter registration or automated voter registration. So one of the things we know about Ohio, and we have a great election system, but our provisional ballot counts are often kind of high because voters forget to update their address. And so a lot of times when we talk to voters about this, they're really confused, right? They're like, but you know where I live because I go to, you know, I pay my taxes and I, and I go to the um, BMV. So you know, once again, this idea of if I walk into a BMV and, and they see that my address has changed and they can say, hey, Jen, your address has changed, which actually just did. <laughs> uh, I'm going to we're going to 
update your voter registration unless you don't want us to. Um, that concept, where are you on that and how do you think we might get that for move, moved forward? I think there, I know there was legislation last General Assembly that um, provided the voter rolls uh, to be updated at the BMV. Um, and I'm sure that there'll be continuing conversations going forward this General Assembly to see how that works. And um, certainly when you're going in every, every few years to, um, to update your driver's license, um, that's, a, that's a way to certainly capture that new address. Um, so I, I'm sure that there'll be continuing conversations about that legislation going forward this General Assembly. And we know that it's actually, it really is another security feature and that if we can be capturing these accurate addresses um, and getting those updated in an efficient way, that it's actually also a security feature. Um, so thank you for your thoughts on that. Can we talk about SB80? So this is one that we don't actually agree on, but I'm going to let you describe it to the audience first and Absolutely. we'll have a conversation about it. So Senate Bill 80 would um, have uh, party designation for Supreme Court and appellate court um, judges races, the judicial races. And the reason behind it is really um, providing greater voter information. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've been asked, um, okay, now the judges, which one's a Democrat, which one's a, a Republican? Um, there are slate cards printed, Democrat and Republican and handed out. Um, Ohio is the only state in the country that has a partisan primary election and then nonpartisan general election. Um, so it, it seems almost like it, it's a ruse. Okay, now, now we're nonpartisan. Um, it's interesting. If you look at, uh, if you look at um, the petitions when you want to uh, become a judge and you have to to have signatures on a petition before you submit it to the Board of Elections. It says right on there, Democrat or Republican or independent. And you'd be surprised, very few people put independent. Almost all of the judicial candidates put Democrat or Republican on that and choose one of those party designations as opposed to independent. So, um, and interesting in the 2020 election, if you look at, uh, at the numbers of people who came out to vote, 1 million fewer people voted for, for the um, Supreme Court justices than they did the top of the ticket. So there's a big voter drop off. And there have been surveys done showing that people want this information. Some people seek it out online, but not everyone has access to internet. Not everyone has a smartphone or a computer or you know, a, the ability to get to a library to do the research they wanna do on a candidate. And it's just a way of providing a little more information to the voter as to um, you know, where certain candidates may stand. There are also a lot of uh, restrictions in judicial races on what you can do and what you can't do. So it's not always easy to get your message out um, a, as a candidate. So it's just a way to provide greater information to, um, to voters, information that voters want. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally understand that voters want this information. So one thing I do wanna plug is we do, the League of Women Voters um, works with the Ohio Supreme Court and the Akron uh, University um, Bliss Center for Applied Politics, I think is the correct mm -hmm. term. Um, for judicial votes count. So maybe one of my friends with League can put that website up there. It actually goes through, it helps you get to know those candidates, but also talks a lot more about how um, courts work, right? So we do understand that part of the drop off is I think folks don't always understand the court system or judges. Um, so you should just know that we have a, we are, um, have a policy that we would like every judicial race to be nonpartisan. Our idea on that is just that um, judges aren't supposed to make policy. Um, they're supposed oh, to judge, yeah. right? And that and that really is ultimately their job is to be nonpartisan. And we often do see judges still being far more nonpartisan um, than other um, 
you, you know, really, really thinking about the, the various um, ways that, that the law affects different individuals, right? And so we're a little worried that it would actually create more partisan judges to have more emphasis on that party designation. But we can respectfully agree to disagree with you. Um, and we hope that folks in the audience will remember that we can always uh, agree to disagree and still work with friends on other things. <laughs> Absolutely. Um... Yep. How about dark money? Can we talk about that? And I think this is an interesting one for you as you're really close to Davis Bessie up there and, and probably have quite a few constituents who work um, for that nuclear plant. Um, oh, but in the meantime, um, what we saw with the passage of that uh, legislation, um, but, but many times uh, voters cannot really follow the money, right? And, and we think that that's a problem if voters can't follow the money then it's hard for them to really make informed decisions. So could you talk to us a little bit about dark money and what we might do about that? I think transparency is very important in elections. And I think um, the voters um, should be able to get that, that kind of information. I mean, really trust is so important it, it, to, um, to voters, especially um, in, in governmental offices. I think it's, uh, it's very important that we do everything we can to, um, to uh, really instill that trust in government. And I think um, that transparency at the, at the campaign finance level is very important in that process. Sorry, I'm keeping myself muted and then was struggling to oh. <laughs> that I would be really good at that with a year of doing this, you know, but uh... Okay, hey, so um, let's talk about that. What what do you think might happen? You know, what might your committee see, or are you thinking about introducing something that would improve transparency? I'm sure there'll be some discussions uh, going forward. Uh, right now, I haven't seen anything uh, introduced at, at this point, but um, you know, certainly it, as things go forward, as we go through this general assembly. Um, if something's introduced, we'll be taking a really close look at it because the goal is to make sure voters have that that confidence, um, not only in the election system, but in the people they're voting for. Um, and I think uh, transparency is, is important. How about, as we talk about how government works and, and transparency, how about redistricting? This is a big year. Um, yeah. And um, so a lot of the folks that are here watching today and, and including constituents in your district helped really bring about the reforms for um, in 2015, where mm -hmm. almost 72% of the voters in all 88 counties supported redistricting reform at the state level. And then in 2018, with almost 75% of voters in all 88 counties. And so we have this chance to really um, change map making to make sure that the public is really participating, that it's more transparent, and that ultimately it's more fair. And I'd just like to hear what you think, you know, what, you know, we should be doing as an organization to work on that, and also what you're going to be doing to work on fair maps. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I was uh, happy to co-sponsor that legislation to create a more bipartisan system when it comes to uh, redistricting and drawing those maps and to see the voters uh, vote for that. So overwhelmingly it is really, um, really telling. And I look forward to seeing this new process play out. It certainly gives more, uh, more minority uh, party support uh, input to the line drawing process, the redistricting process. So it'll be um, both parties, it'll be bipartisan, um, a bipartisan process going forward and I'm looking forward to seeing it, it through. Thank you for that. And, you know, I, I wonder about now that we have census delays and, and I do know there's an active lawsuit, but mm -hmm. we might need to change some of these timelines. And I know it seems impossible to change timelines because it's in the constitution, but COVID has certainly taught us that lots of things have to move that we thought were unmovable. And I'm just wondering if your caucus or you, your committee are talking about how we might handle that. Yeah, I, I don't know what the new timeline will be. I'm certainly hopeful that we get the census information um, uh, sooner than expected and that we're able to uh, get the, started, the process started earlier. 
but I don't have any information as to when that'll be um, just yet. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, audience, just so you know, there is a lawsuit. Um, the state of Ohio is asking the Census Bureau for the information earlier. Um, League is worried about that just because we don't want to make, you know, bad data would make bad maps. And we do know that the census has right. asked for a longer timeline. Mm -hmm. And let's keep in mind that our census data is also used for transportation planning and education funding and, and, and you know, millions and millions of dollars every year go to communities based on this data. So um, we'll have to see, but I look forward to working with you if we need to maybe push back the primary or, you know, think of other creative solutions. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll be communicating um, as things as things go on because we just don't know what you know what that's going to look like and when that's going to come out just yet. So, yeah. How about another issue that we're really interested in? And um, you know, during last year we all worked really hard, and I mean all of us, the elections officials, the legislature, the voter advocates, oh, yeah. Secretary of State, on making sure that folks could participate in democracy without risking their health, right? And I'm really proud of what we all did collectively, but we are kind of in that same situation right now in, in the state house where we have seen some COVID um, cases, quite a few. Um, and, you know, my board, for example, does not want me going to the state house. They think I can't really serve this organization if I were to get COVID. And so there's this work on getting virtual testimony. And I'm just wondering, um, I know that's in the house, but are conversations happening in the Senate? And where would you stand on that? Um, well, I haven't seen any legislation coming through the Senate regarding that. I, one thing, working remotely and, and Zoom meetings um, like this have been really effective. Um, I've been able to realize I can, I can stack my whole day with, with Zoom meetings. And it's, uh, it's been really an effective way to connect with voters, to connect with um, uh, organizations like the League of Women Voters, to connect with constituents and, and businesses and organizations on, on a number of different issues. Um, never knew what Zoom was before the pandemic. And now it's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, used every day. Um, but I think uh, when it comes to official business and, and governmental offices and, and the workings, um, you know, I know there have been a lot of concerns raised as to whether or not um, working remotely should continue in that aspect. Um, I, I'm encouraged that as the vaccine's coming out and people are getting vaccinated, that uh, we'll be able to get things back to normal um, sooner rather than later, I think. Uh, you know, the, the eligible, eligible groups keep expanding and um, I, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll continue to see that process. And, and certainly um, I really value the in-person meetings and that the in-person testimony and being able to have those conversations and, and being able to talk to someone in, in person in, a, in, in committee, as opposed to doing that work remotely is. And right now, a lot of folks are just submitting written testimony, which seems far less valuable than having, you know, this kind of conversation through, um, you know, a digital approach. So I do ask you to consider it, especially again, you know, for those of us who aren't in Columbus, you know, um, yeah, go ahead. Speaking of the timeline, the legislation now, and by the time it gets to the process and then at 90 days, um, I'm thinking if we're going to be vaccinated by the time the legislation would actually um, be through the process is my, my thinking um, it, that I don't know if that would really help us right now because that's uh, something that um, wouldn't go into effect for, for quite a while. And I'm hopeful that um, by the time, however long that legislation takes to get through and then another 90 days that we're, we're gonna be vaccinated and protected and able to get back to business as normal. Although I, there are some things I think will always, uh, will be forever changed. I think we'll be able to continue to have meetings remotely and, and do different um, correspondence in ways we haven't before. Um, and I think, um, I think there are some things that will always, that will always be just a little different going forward, but, uh, um, when it comes to official business, I think um, in person is always the, the preferred way. 
I totally agree. I, I hope that we'll continue to talk about it, just mm -hmm. especially, you know, if you think about folks who need to get childcare or someone with a disability or a senior citizen who doesn't want to take all the time or, you know, a doctor or an expert who can't take all day to be in the state house, but could help you um, and, and your various committees um, understand the legislation. But let's keep going. Lots of questions I have from the audience. One is about HB1, so the education reform. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Maybe you could explain to the, to the audience what it is. Well, um, school funding is, uh, is really a, a top priority. And of course that's over in the house um, still. So, um, you know, as it comes over to the Senate, we'll certainly be taking a look at that. But I think education funding is something we're gonna be looking um, at through the budget process as well, as the budget comes over. Um, HB1 has, um, you know, requires a lot of additional funding. I believe it's $2 billion. Um, and so it's important to look at, at that funding through the budget process and see how that, that works with the overall budget. Um, so uh, as, so I, I'm the vice chair of finance and as, you know, as the budget comes over, I'm sure we're gonna be looking at that and, and House Bill 1, um, as that comes over, I, I'm sure we're gonna be having a lot of testimony and a lot of, uh, a lot of conversation discussing, but we need to make sure that our schools have the resources they need to educate our kids. Again, I, my, my kids all went to public schools and, and I, I volunteered in the schools and worked with the teachers and they do such great work um, for our kids. And it, I think it's um, important that we're, we're looking at things and, and doing things differently. Um, Bob Cup and, and John Patterson, when they came together and formed, I guess it's been a few years now, these task forces. To, what I appreciated about that is that it came from people with, uh, you know, boots on the ground. I mean, people who work in the field. And um, certainly uh, uh, Tom Hosler, one of my superintendents in Perrysburg, uh, kept me in the loop. He was on uh, one of the task forces and uh, we talked throughout the process. But um, so I, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to look when it comes over from the house. And I'm not sure exactly how this is going to look as it goes, uh, as we look through the budget process. But I think it's important that uh, when we look at school funding, that we make sure that it's something that we can, um, we can afford. Um, because uh, last thing we want to do is, is pass legislation that we can't fund. Uh, we want to make sure that, that what we pass is something that... Uh, we're going to be able to fund, and I think education is a is a priority. Absolutely, um, I'm working through the questions. There's so many. How about um, broadband? And I know for fact that broadband is a challenge in parts of your district. As someone who is often in your district, can we talk about how we're going to expand broadband to all folks um, in Ohio? Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, the Senate. Um, recently passed broadband legislation, and I believe the House passed similar legislation. Uh, boy, oh, did the pandemic ever shine a light on the need for broadband and, um, and internet connectivity. I mean, we have kids who, some kids who don't have access to internet, you know, had to be very creative. And in, in, um, I had heard about kids sitting in a car in a parking lot at a McDonald's so they could tap into, to Wi-Fi, so they could, you know, really learn their lessons. I mean, it's uh, it's something we need to really um, focus on making sure that we have access to internet throughout the state. It's something that is uh, is really important, and and certainly the pandemic really um, shined a light on this. So. Um... You just mentioned that you're a vice chair of finance, and I would be remiss to say, you know, it was only a few decades before, it was actually in my lifetime, in our lifetime, that women weren't even serving on finance. I the first woman to serve on the finance really? in the House was actually Joan Lawrence, um, a, a Republican uh, lawmaker from the greater central Ohio area, who also was our board chair for many years, um, redistricting expert. So I just wanted to, pause for a second, we have so much more we need to do in terms of closing leadership gaps, but it's so great that you're vice chair. What do you think are gonna be some of the biggest challenges in terms of the budget this year? Well, um, certainly it's uh, a year like no other, but um, 
I think, um, you know, some of the things I think we're going to be focusing on, you know, obviously ed education is going to be very important, but, you know, I can tell you a personal priority is H2 Ohio. I want to make sure that we're continuing to fund that, uh, that program going forward. I, I love the idea of, of focusing on the Department of Ag and the Lake Erie Commission and the EPA and, um, and can't remember the fourth <laughs> right now at the top. Oh, um, ODNR, um, and, and really focusing on on the different aspects and what we can do um, to come together to really make sure we're preserving Lake Erie. Um, and uh, so that's that's going to be very important going forward. And then coming out of this pandemic, um, we need to make sure as we come out that we are coming out stronger than ever. And um, we need to make sure our businesses um, have what they need to, to, you know, are able to, we need business friendly policies that are going to help them thrive and grow and, and build our economy and, and keep people working. And hopefully we'll be able to get people back to work quickly as, uh, as we transition out of this pandemic. Um, so we, we have a lot of different issues to tackle, but I, I think it's important um, that we focus on things that are gonna help people at this time. Thank you so much. We're at work, time is flying because we are having so much fun. I wanted to quickly ask you about the Ohio Fairness Act, which would extend, would, would really more anti-discrimination protection for the LGBTQ mm -hmm. Ohioans. And do right. you have a stance on that, Senator? Um, I, I don't know if legislation has been introduced this General Assembly. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yep. I haven't seen the legislation yet. Pardon me? We're feeling hopeful that it is definitely moving forward as a bipartisan initiative in the, in the um, legislature. Right. And certainly I had numerous meetings last General Assembly about that um, um, for, um, with proponents of the bill, but also the chambers and, and different uh, business groups, all very supportive of... Uh, of that uh, that legislation, I haven't seen I haven't seen legislation this uh, general assembly, um, and I don't know who's introduced it, but certainly look forward to uh, those conversations continuing. Um, well, I think we're done. I have a couple announcements, but do you have any final words for the League of Women Voters and what we can do to support the voters of Ohio? Well, one thing I want to thank you. I, I certainly always appreciate the League of Women Voters and the work you do to help inform people and, and provide that information and make sure it's accessible and that people um, can get to better know the people who are on the ballot, the people who represent them. And certainly uh, a forum like this um, can be a great way to get to know someone on a different level. So I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today and thank you for all your hard work. Well, thank you, Senator. And thanks for always doing our, our candidate forums. And I think we're gonna have to visit with you again just because of uh, your, our heart's work is often in your committee. So I think we will be inviting you back soon. Um, but in the meantime, we need to look at these slides. Thank you. And um, first off, if you have a question for the Senator, here's her contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out to her. She's always very communicative to me and, and the folks in the league in her area. Um, let's go to the next slide. Just want to remind everybody, we have more events coming. If you have ideas of folks we think we should interview for Luncheon with the League, let us know. Uh, the Senator talked a lot about transparency. You can learn more about that. The League. Oh, no, that's okay. You can go, Mania. Um, make sure you join the League. We uh, need all the members we can get. Students are only $5. We actually have quite a few BG students, um, Senator, and we'd love to have some more. Let's keep going. And thank you so much. We hope that you all have a great uh, week. And Senator, I look forward to seeing you soon. I, I hope that we'll all be vaccinated as well. And we'll be hanging out in the state house talking about what we're going to do to make Ohio even better. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day.